Live from San Jose, California, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data Silicon Valley 2017. For the CUBE coverage of Big Data Silicon Valley or Big Data SV hashtag Big Data SV. In conjunction with Strata Hadoop, I'm John Furrier with the Cube, and my co-host George Gilbert, analyst at Wikibon. I'm excited to have our next guest, uh, Yaron Haviv, who's the founder and CTO of Gazio. Uh, just wrote in a post up on Silicon Angle. Check it out. Welcome to the Cube. <laughs> Thanks, John. Great Thanks to see you. Me. You've been a guest blog this week on Silicon Angle, and always great on Twitter because Dave Vellante always like to bring you into the contentious yeah, I, I conversations. I like the <laughs> controversial <laughs> ones. <yes. laughs> and you had a lot of good color on that. So uh, let's just get right into it. So your company is doing some really innovative things. We Thanks. were just talking before we came on camera here about some of the uh, amazing performance improvements you guys have on, on many different levels. But first, take a step back and let's talk about what this continuous analytics platform is because it's unique, it's different, mm -hmm. and it's got impact. Take a minute to explain. Sure, so uh, first few words on, on Iguazi, we're developing a, a data platform which is unified, so basically you can ingest data through many different APIs, and it's more like a cloud service. It is for on-prem and edge locations and co-location, but it's managed more like a cloud platform, so very uh, similar experience to Amazon. It's software. It's, it's software. We do integrate a lot with hardware in, in order to achieve our performance, which is really uh, about 10 to 100 times faster than what exists today. Um, but uh, the point that we're, we've talked to a lot of customers and what we really want to uh, focus with customers is solving business problems because I think a lot of the Hadoop camp started with more solving IT problems. So IT is going kicking tires and eventually failing based on your statistics and Gartner statistics. Uh, so what we really wanted to, to solve is big uh, business problems. And uh, what we, we figured out that uh, this notion of pipeline architecture where you ingest data and then curate it and fix it, et cetera, uh, which was uh, very good for the early days of Hadoop. If you think about how Hadoop started, it was uh, page ranking from Google. There was no uh, time sensitivity. You could take uh, days uh, to calculate it and recalibrate your search engine. Uh, based on your research, everyone is now looking for real-time insights. Mm -hmm. Okay. So there is uh, sensor data from cars, there is uh, stock data from exchanges, there is uh, uh, fraud uh, data from, uh, from banks, and you need to, to act very, uh, very quickly. So this notion of, uh, and I can give you examples from customers, this notion of taking data, creating parquet file and log files and storing them in S3, and then taking Redshift and, and analyzing them, and then maybe a few hours later having an insight, uh, this is not going to work. And, and what you need to fix is you have to put some structure into the data because if you need to update a single record, you cannot just create a huge file of 10 gigabyte and just and then analyze it. Uh, so what we, we did is basically a mechanism where you ingest data. And while you, as you ingest the data, you can run multiple different processes on the same thing and you can also serve the data immediately, okay? And, uh, and a few examples that we, we demonstrate here in the show, one is video surveillance, very nice uh, uh, movie style uh, example that you, you basically ingest pictures through our S3 API, through Object API. You analyze the, the picture to detect faces, to de detect scenery, uh, to extract geolocation from pictures and all that, all those through different processes. TensorFlow doing uh, one uh, serverless functions that we have to do other simpler tasks. And at the same time, you can have dashboards that just show everything. And you can have Spark that basically does a query. So where was this guy last seen? Or uh, who was uh, he with? You know, or think about the Boston Barn example. You could just do it in real time. Uh, because you don't need this notion of pipeline. And this solves uh, very hard uh, business problems for some of the customers we work with. So that's the key innovation, there's no pipelining. You no guys, pipeline. and how, what's the secret sauce? Uh, so first, uh, you know, our system does about a couple of million of transactions per second, and uh, we are a multi-model database. So basically you can ingest data as a stream, exactly the same data could be read by Spark as a table. So you basically issue a query on the same data, give me everything that has a certain pattern or, or something, and could also be served immediately uh, through RESTful APIs to a dashboard running AngularJS or some, something like that. Uh, so that's the secret sauce is by having this uh, integration and this unique data model, it allows you all those uh, work uh, things to work together. There are other aspects, like we have transactional semantics. One of the challenges is how do you make sure that a bunch of uh, processes don't collide when they update the same data. So first you need the very low granularity 
because each one may update a different field. Like this example that I gave uh, with GeoData, the uh, serverless function that does the GeoData extraction only updates the GeoData uh, fields within the record. And uh, maybe TensorFlow uh, updates information about the image in a different uh, location in the in the record or in potentially different records. So you have to have uh, that in along with transaction safety, along with uh, security. We have very tight security at the field level, uh, identity level. So that's um, rethinking the entire architecture. And I think what many of the companies you'll see at the show, they say, okay, Hadoop is given. Uh, let's build some sort of uh, convenience tools around it. Let's do some scripting. Let's do automation. But sort of the underlying thing, I won't use dirty words, but <laughs> is not uh, well equipped to, to the new challenges of real time. And we basically restructured everything. We took the notions of cloud native architectures. We took the notions of, of flash and uh, latest flash technologies, a lot of parallelism on CPUs. We didn't take anything from gra for granted on the underlying ar architecture. So when you found the company, just th take a personal story here. What was the itch you were scratching? How, why did you get into <coughs> this? Obviously you have a huge tech advantage, which is, we'll double, double down on the research piece. Uh, George will have some questions, mm -hmm. but you know, what got you going with the company? Um, you got a unique approach people would love to do with the pipeline. It sounds great, and the performance, you said, what, 100X? So what, how did you get here? <laughs> Tell ah, the story. So, uh, so if, you, if you know my, my background, I ran uh, all the data center activities in uh, Mellanox, and you know yeah. Mellanox, I know Kevin was here. And, uh, and my role was to take Mellanox technology, which is 100 gig networking and silicon, and fit it into the different applications. So I worked with SAP HANA, I worked with Teradata, I worked on Oracle Exadata, I worked with all uh, the cloud service providers on building their own object storage and NoSQL and other solutions. I also owned all the open source activities around uh, Hadoop and Ceph and all those projects. And, and my role was to fix many of those, or <laughs> to come to, cus to a customer who says, I don't need 100 gig, it's too fast for me. And uh, how do I, and, and my role was to convince him that yes, I can open up all the bottleneck all the way up to your uh, stack, so you can leverage those, uh, those new technologies. And through that, we, we basically saw the inefficiencies in those stacks. And so you had a good purview of the marketplace. Yeah. You had open source on one hand, and then all the All the storage vendors, players, Network. All the database players and all the cloud service providers uh, were my customers. So you're at a very unique point where you see the trajectory of cloud doing th things totally different. And I sometimes I, I see the trajectory of enterprise storage, SAN, NAS, you know, all flash, all that legacy technologies where sort of cloud providers are all about object, key value, no SQL, you know. Uh, and you're trying to convince those guys that maybe they're going the wrong way, but it's pretty hard. Uh, but are they, they going the wrong way? I think they are going the wrong way. I, I you know everyone, for example, is running uh, to do NVMe over fabric now. That's the new fashion. Okay, I did the first implementation of NVMe over fabric in my in my team at Mellanox, and and I really loved that at that time. But databases cannot run on top of s storage area networks because there are serialization problems. Okay, if you use a storage area network, that means that every node in the cluster have to go and and serialize an operation against a shared media. And that's not how Google and Amazon works. There's a lot more databases out there too and a lot more data <laughs> sources, you got the edge. Yeah, but all the new databases, all the modern databases, they basically shard the data yep. across the different nodes, so there are no serialization problems. So that's why Oracle doesn't scale, or scale to uh, 10 nodes at, at best with a lot of RDMA as a backplane to allow that. Uh, and that's why Amazon can scale to 1,000 nodes. Or, or Google Spanner. And that's the horizontally scalable piece that's happening. Yeah, because basically the no, the data, ha the distribution has to move into the higher layers of the data and not the lower layers of the data. And that's really the trajectory where the traditional legacy uh, storage and system vendors are going. And, and we sort of uh, followed uh, the way the cloud w guys went, just wi with our knowledge of the infrastructure, uh, we sort of did it better than what the cloud guys did. Because the cloud guys uh, focus more on the higher levels of the implementation, the algorithms, the paxos and all that. Uh, their implementation is not that efficient. And we did both sides extremely efficient. How about the edge? Because that's edge is now part of cloud and you got cloud, it's got the compute, all the benefits you were saying and still they have their own consumption uh, uh, opportunities and challenges that everyone else does. But yeah. edge is now exploding. The combination of those things coming together at the intersection of that is deep learning, 
machine learning, which is powering the AI hype. Mm -hmm. So how is the edge factoring into, into your plan and overall architectures for the cloud? Yeah, so so uh, I wrote uh, a bunch of posts that are not published yet about uh, the edge, but uh, my analysis along with, uh, with your analysis and, and Pierre Levine's analysis is that cloud have to sort of start uh, distribute more. Um, because if you're looking at the, the trends, five gig, uh, 5G uh, Wi-Fi in uh, wireless networking is going to be a gigabit traffic, okay? Gigabit to the home driven by Google, 70 bucks a month, you know, is going to push a lot more uh, bandwidth at the edge. On the same time, uh, cloud providers, in order to lower costs and deal with energy problems, they're going to rural uh, areas, okay? And the traditional uh, way we solve uh, cloud problems was to put CDNs. So you, every time you download a picture or a video, you go to a CDN. When you go to Netflix, you don't really go to Amazon. Yeah. You go to uh, a Netflix uh, pop, one of 250 uh, locations. And, uh, but the new workloads are different because they're no longer pictures that need to be cached. First, there are a lot of data going up, you know, sensor data, you know, upload files, et cetera. Data is becoming a lot more structured. Mm -hmm. Sensor data is structured, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, all this car uh, car information will be uh, structured, and you want to uh, basically digest or summarize the data. So you need uh, technologies like machine learning and NI and, and all those things. So the new you need something which is like CDNs, just a mini version of cloud that sits somewhere in between the the edge and the and the cloud. And this is our approach. And now. Because we can sort of shrink wrap a mini cloud, a mini Amazon in way more dense uh, approach, uh, then this is a play that we're going to, to take. And uh, we have uh, a very good partnership with Equinix, which is distributed in 170 uh, something locations. We have a uh, very good relationship. So you're essentially going to disrupt the CDN. It's something I've been writing about <laughs> and tweeting yes. about. I mean, CDNs were based on the old Yahoo days. Caching images, you mentioned. That's, yes. that's the, you know, give me 1999 back, please. You know, that's, that's <laughs> old school today standards. So it's a whole new architecture because of how things are stored. You have to be a lot more distributed. What is the architecture? So uh, in our innovation, we have two layers of innovation. One is sort of on the lower layers of, we actually have three main innovations. One is sort of on the lower layers mm -hmm. of what we discussed. The other one is sort of the security layer where we classify everything layer seven at 100 gig uh, traffic rates. And the third one is all this notion of distributed uh, system. Uh, we can actually run multiple uh, mm -hmm. systems in multiple locations and manage them as one uh, logical entity through high-level semantics, high-level policies. Okay, so when we take the cube global, uh, we're going to have <laughs> <Yes>. you guys <laughs> on uh, every pop. No, this is a legit no, question. No, it's going to take time for us. Well, you know, we're not going to do everything in one day, and we're starting with uh, local problems. Yeah, well, this is Sarah. digital transformation. So stay with for a second. So here's the stay with this uh, the scenario. So video, like Netflix, is pretty much one dimension. It's video, and so there's a <laughs> there's certainly like use CDNs now. But when you start thinking in different content types, so I'm going to have a video with maybe a CGI overlaid or social graph data coming in from tweets at the same time with mm -hmm. Instagram pictures. I might be accessing multiple data everywhere to watch a, a, a movie or something. That yes. would require beyond a CDN thinking. And you have to run continuous analytics because you cannot afford batch. You cannot afford a pipeline because you ingest picture data, you may need to add uh, some subtext uh, with the data and, and feed it directly to the consumer. So you have to move to those two, uh, two elements of you know, moving more stuff into the edge and running into continuous analytics versus a batch and pipeline. So you think, based on that scenario, what I just said, that there's going to be an opportunity for somebody to take over the media landscape, for sure. Yeah, I think if you're also looking at uh, the st statistics for, uh, I've I seen a, a nice article, I, I told uh, George about it, that uh, looking at analyzing the Intel chip uh, distribution, and uh, what you see is that there is a 30% growth on Intel chips uh, into cloud, which is faster than what most analysts anticipate in terms of cloud growth. That means actually that cloud is going to cannibalize enterprise faster than what most think. Uh, enterprise is shrinking about 7% seven, seven and, and there is another place which is growing, it's telcos. It's not, not growing like cloud, but part of it is because of this move towards uh, the edge and the move of telcos my, uh, buying white boxes. So and 5G and access on over the top too. Yeah, but that's server chips. So there okay. basically there's going to be more and more computation in the different uh, telecom oh, locations. About compute, okay. And, and, and <coughs> yeah, and this is, uh, this is an opportunity that we can capitalize on if we run fast enough. It, it, sounds, um, it sounds as though because you've implemented these 
sort of industry standard APIs that you know come from the largely the open source ecosystem that you can propagate those to areas on the network that the vendors who are behind those APIs can't necessarily do, um, you know, into the telcos, towards the edge. And I assume part of that is because of the density um, and the simplicity. Like, mm -hmm. so that essentially your footprint's smaller in terms of hardware and the s operational simplicity is greater. Is that yeah. a, f a fair assessment? Yes, uh, so, uh, and also we, we support a lot of uh, Amazon compatible APIs which are uh, RESTful, typically HTTP based, yeah. very convenient to work with in, in a cloud environment. Uh, another thing is uh, because we're sort of taking all the state on, on ourselves, the different forms of states, whether it's a message queue or a table or, a, or an object, etc., that makes the computation layer very simple. So one of the things that we're also demonstrating is the integration we have with Kubernetes that basically now simplifies Kubernetes because you don't have to build all those different data services for cloud native infrastructure. You just run Kubernetes, where the volume driver, where the database, where the message queues, where everything underneath Kubernetes, and then you just run Spark or TensorFlow or a serverless function as a Kubernetes microservice. And so that allows you now elastically to increase the number of uh, Spark jobs that you need, or maybe you have another tenant, you just you know spawn a, a Spark job. Uh, you know, Yarn has some of those attributes, but Yarn is very limited, very confined to the uh, Hadoop ecosystem. TensorFlow is not an Hadoop player, and uh, a bunch of those new tools are not an Hadoop players. And you, uh, everyone is now adopting a new way of doing streaming, and they just call it serverless. Mm -hmm. you know, serverless and streaming are very uh, similar mm -hmm. uh, technologies. The, the advantage of serverless is uh, all this prepackaging and all this automation of the CI CD you know, the continuous integration, continuous development. So we're taking, uh, in order to simplify the, the developer and uh, operation aspects, uh, we're trying to integrate more and more with cloud native approach around CI CD and, and uh, integration with Kubernetes and cloud native technologies. You, would it be fair to say that from a developer or admin point of view, you're, you're pushing out from the cloud towards the edge faster than if, you know, the existing implementations, uh, you know, say the Apache ecosystem or, or the AWS ecosystem, you know, where they, uh, AWS has something on the edge, I forgot that, the yeah, whether it's Snowball or yeah. green grass or whatever, yeah. you know, where they at least get the, the Lambda function. And they're and few, by the way, and it's yeah. interesting to see. One of the things they did, they uh, ad allowed Lambda functions in their CDNs, which is sort of uh, going the direction I, I mentioned, just very minimal functionality. Uh, another thing, uh, they have those uh, boxes where they have a single VM and they can run Lambda function as well. Uh, but I think their ability to run computation is very uh, limited and also their focus is on shipping the boxes through mail uh, and we, we want it to be always connected. Yaron, final question for you, just to get your thoughts. Great, great segment, by the way, it's very informative and we should do a follow up on Skype on our studio for Silicon Valley Friday show. But what, I mean, Google Next was interesting. I mean, they're serious about the enterprise, but you can see that they're not yet there. Mm -hmm. um, what is the enterprise readiness uh, perspective from your, your perspective? Because Google has the tech, and you know, they try to flaunt the tech. We're great, we're Google, look at us, therefore you should buy us. It's not that easy in the enterprise. Um, how would you, you know, size up you know, the different players? Because you know, they're not all like Amazon, although Amazon is winning. You get Amazon, Azure, and Google. Your thoughts on the cloud players? Yeah, so, so the way we, we attack enterprise, we don't attack it from an enterprise perspective or IT perspective, we attack it from a business uh, use case perspective, especially because we're small and we have to run, uh, mm -hmm. to run fast. So you need to identify uh, a, a real critical business problem. Like we're working with stock exchanges and they have a lot of issues uh, around uh, you know, monitoring the daily uh, trade activities in real time, okay? Mm -hmm. and, and if you compare what we do with them on this continuous analytics notion to how they work with Excels and sort of dupes, and it's like uh, totally different. And now they could do things which are uh, way different. And I think that uh, one of the things that uh, those customers, you know, if Google wants to succeed against Amazon, they have to uh, find a way of how to approach those business owners and say, here's a problem, Mr. Customers, here's a business challenge, here's what I'm going to solve. If they're just going to say, you know what, my VMs are cheaper than Amazon, it's not going to be a um, huge uh, Yeah, also ship. they're doing the whole, they're calling lift and shift, which is code word for rip and replace in the mm -hmm. enterprise. So that's essentially 
I guess, a good opportunity if you can get people to do that, but not everyone's yeah. ripping and replacing and lifting and shifting. Uh, but a lot of Google advantages around areas of AI and things like that. So they should try and, and leverage, if you think about uh, you know, Amazon approach to AI, they sort of uh, funded the university to build a project and then sort of uh, said it's ours, you know, where, uh, where uh, Google uh, created TensorFlow and created a lot of other uh, IPs, you know, and Dataflow and all those uh, solutions and contributed to the community. So I really love uh, Google's approach of contributing Kubernetes, contributing yep. TensorFlow. And, th and this way they're sort of uh, planting the seeds, so the new generation that is gonna work with Kubernetes and TensorFlow, you know, say, you know what, why would I m mess with this uh, thing on-prem, I'll just sort of go and- Right to the cloud, uh, do multi-cloud. Right to the cloud. Uh, but yeah. th I think a lot of uh, criticism about uh, Google is that uh, they're too sort of research-oriented, they don't know how to monetize and approach yeah. the-, the so it's, it's just enterprise is just a whole different drumbeat, and I think that's the only thing on my complaint with them, and they gotta, get, gotta get that knowledge and, and or buy companies. Have a quick f final point on Spanner, any uh, analysis of Spanner that went from paper to, to, to so pretty uh, quickly, <laughs> from paper to product. So before we started Iguazio, I, I studied uh, Sp uh, Spanner quite a bit. All the publications that was there and all the other things like Spanner, uh, Spanner has the underlying layer called Colossus and, and our data layer is very similar to how Colossus works. So we're very familiar, we took a lot of concepts from Spanner. And you like Spanner's legit? Yes. Again, <laughs> I think, that, I think uh, that we haven't copied. You know, I think you borrow some good pra best practices. Uh, uh, well, we, I think I studied about three hundred uh, research papers before <laughs> we did the architecture. Yeah. Wow. Uh, but we basically took the best of each one of them because there's still a lot of issues. Most of those technologies, by the way, are designed for mechanical disks, and I, we can yeah. talk about it uh, in and a you, different. And you have flash. All right, you're on. We, we had <laughs> gone over here. Great segment. We're here live in Silicon Valley, breaking it down, getting into the under the hood, looking at a 10x, 100x performance advantages. Uh, keep an eye on Agazio. They're looking like they've got some great product. Check them out. This is theCUBE. I'm John Furrier with George Gilbert. We'll be back with more after the short break. Thanks.